hello, hello, is this thing on? I think I'm talking through a satellite here on Staring into the Abyss. We're projecting from the moon with my fellow moon fellow, Matt Brandenburg. Can you hear me? <laughs> How you bastards doing up there? Did you find any MacGuffinite? <laughs> we also have another moon fellow with Danger Slater, author of the book Moon Fellows. Yeah. Wow. What an intro. I, I like that. I, it's it's very, we're in the book already. We are. We, we are, are in the world. We are in the world. <laughs> so I will, I will say for our audience, we, we don't really prep our intros. I just kind of think of something random and I thought it'd be really funny to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like a good pr like practice. I'm like, all right, what am I going to say? That's crazy. Yeah. Um, sometimes just catch, catch him off guard, catch him off guard. <laughs> um, but Today we'll be talking about the book Moonfellows with Danger Slater. Excellent, yes. Which you can pick up through Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. And it is a fantastic, bizarro, I guess I would say bizarro. It's a fantastic, weird, bizarre book that is tons of fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, we bought we bought the website moonfacts.org, which just links to the Perpetual Motion Machine website. <laughs> <laughs> so so that whenever we were promoting it we could just start dropping moonfacts.org and we bought it that one because it's the most official website we could find that had the word moon <laughs> in it that was still available <laughs> that's so funny that that would be still available you would think some i don't know some like science teacher would have bought it already yeah it, th that's what i was saying too and i'm like it's so funny too because this book is probably the least factual <laughs> book about uh, the least science the least sciencey science fiction based book ever written. I'm surprised it wasn't a Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing website. Wait, you're saying that's available still? It might be. Oh. Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean this isn't all full of facts? All my moon knowledge is wrong. Yeah, I'm so sorry for misleading you. This is, I feel terrible. <laughs> yeah, Moon's a really good source for MacGuffinite, which is like better than coal. So like, we really just fuck things up. Like if we, if we just, if we just went to the moon and got the MacGuffinite, maybe global warming would be solved. Who fucking knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the intention that, you know, the, uh, you need that, 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 ineffable thing that everybody is chasing that that is the <laughs> gonna make things better and fix the world and fix everybody's problem and get everybody <laughs> home and it's just impossible to get right. <laughs> because yep. it is literally the MacGuffin of the story <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I was dying when that came up I was just like <laughs> this is the best <laughs> yeah but before we get deeper into Moonfellows um, that sounded a lot weirder than I expected it to uh, <laughs> get really deep. Just get nice. really deep. I get looped up in everything. <laughs> no. um, got my Astro Glide right next to me. Yeah, well, that's that, that is the Astro Glide. Please like email me. That um, is the only lube uh, endorsed by NASA. <laughs> 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 wow. Like we I got, mean, NASA we, does we like their water based food lubricants. and Astro Glide. Yeah. Perfect. KY Jelly, pff, that's for Earthlings. That's for Earth people. <laughs> Real Astro astronauts use Astroglide. <laughs> uh, we like to give a kind of like a rundown of some media that we watched this week and or read. And it's been a couple weeks since we've recorded, so we could try to kind of keep it on the shorter side, maybe. Okay. We tend to fail at that, but you never know. Yeah. Um, so last night I decided to watch Prey on Hulu. Nice. Which is like the first part of the movie that hasn't sucked in like 30 years. <laughs> five out of five. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's honestly, it's a really fucking good movie. Like, it stopped all the bell and whistles, and it just gave us what makes Predator work. Now, the big question is, do we have an intense handshake? There is no intense handshakes. So we, do, <laughs> we do have Canadian French colonizers. Okay, well, I guess that will work. With it's almost the same. There's, a, there's actually a really funny scene where like all the Can all the French Canadians shoot their rifles at the predator and then have to go and refill their musket balls and the predator <laughs> kills them while they're refilling their rifles. 
he like checks his watch first, you know, he taps his toe a little bit and then goes in. <laughs> but um, so how long have predators just been hanging around on Earth? Like well, a couple this, hundred this years one, at this point? This, this one kind of shows up and it's like a primitive version of the predators that we see in the other movies. So like oh. its technology isn't as like it still has the heat vision. It still has like the camouflage, but like it doesn't have all like the crazy bells and whistles with like if they get caught, they can kill themselves in a nuclear explosion and Aww. like all that <laughs> shit. It's it's a bit more like primitive than the other predators. Like it's even its helmet that it wears looks more like an animal skull than like an actual helmet. So they're like on the same um technology i'm trying to think of the word they're on the same path we are in technology <laughs> kind of maybe but they have still spaceships and like fucking it's 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 just they're, they're not on they're not as advanced as you see them in the schwarzenegger movie okay um like but like whatever could decimate a uh, a tribe of people in two seconds you can't have that yeah. because the movie would just be over <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah right we yeah. gotta hobble them a little bit <laughs> and the movie follows a uh, comanche girl who wants to be a warrior but her tribe laughs at the idea of it because she's a woman and we all know that women are only good for like making medicine and cooking food and not hunting animals <laughs> um <laughs> so she wants to prove them wrong and then she's out hunting one day and she sees this creature who's invisible, just fucking brutal as a bear. Nice. And then she's just like, yeah, there's something out there. And everyone like laughs at her. And then she ends up like having to face this thing one on one. And people realizing like, oh, shit, there actually is this crazy creature that's slaughtering everything that it sees as a threat because it's a predator and they hunt <laughs> what they consider their prey. And... It's really intense. The cinematography is beautiful. It's the same guy who did 10 Cloverfield Lane. Nice. That's a good movie. And this is his second movie. Like, oh, how, crazy. Has he, how has he not done more movies than, like, 10 Cloverfield Lane and a Predator <laughs> movie? How did this not get a theatrical release? Is it, is it so, just kind of, like, small scale, or what's the deal? So the deal, what I read is... This was kind of signed contracts before Disney bought Fox. And if they released it in theaters, it would have gone to like, if they released it in theaters, it would have made the streaming rights weird due to contract negotiations. So Disney put it on Hulu so they can maximize their profit because Disney owns 20th Century Studios now. I see. So, so it was like, it was like, it was yeah. like a great streaming thing, and then they decided to to maximize their own profit to put it on their streaming service instead of putting it in the theaters first. I hate that you have to, like, no contract negotiations just to figure out how to see something you want to watch. <laughs> right? You know? Like, especially as a lot of stuff that gets put on streaming, Netflix especially, they, there's not really advertising for any of this. Like, no. you, things will just fly completely under the radar and disappear within a week. You'll be like, wait, that was, that was a new movie by some famous director. No one even fucking talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I started watching Paper Girls on Netflix. Yeah. On Netflix on Amazon. And um, I had no fucking idea Paper Girls came out. Until yeah. I logged into like Prime one day, and I was like, "Oh shit, Paper Girls is out!" And it been out for like a fucking week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's I saw a, a trailer for it when I went to see Nope, and that's all I knew it came out. I was like, "Wait, what?" Paper Girls is really good, by the way. Also, nice. side note: <laughs> Have you have um, you read the comic? I have it on hold at the library. I haven't picked it up yet. Oh, the comic's awesome. Yeah, I really like that writer. I just read Saga recently. Yes. So uh, you know the opposite of war is fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Saga Saga is honestly one of the best comics that ever existed. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I agree with that, and it's only half over. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I love I love how wild it is too. Like I'll never forget like uh, what was it the Prince Robot the fourth dying and like almost about to die in battle, and he just. His last visions are just men fucking each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a giant fucking gay orgy of like yeah. his mind as he's like about to die. 
He has a he has a pretty big dick for a robot. <laughs> that is true. I mean, well, it's like a tripod, pretty much. I mean, if you're a robot. Well, Sa- Sag is a fantastic comic, like, and also he did. I think he did a DMZ, which is also a really good comic. Oh yeah. Um, and he did Why the Last One on Earth, which the TV show sucked, but that comic was really good. Well, see, that's another one, like you said. I didn't even know that came out. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why you didn't know why the last one. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see. <laughs> they kind of like they knew it was bad, so they just kind of like snuck it out there. Do you think they just do advertising after the fact? Like when they realize the show's good or already a hit, they're like, oh, now we can talk about it. This isn't yeah. embarrassing. Like yeah, maybe. Right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I feel like they used to advertise this stuff more than they do now. Yeah. I think they like, what was it? D- like Warner Brothers canceling the Batgirl movie? Oh God! Yeah. yeah, because like they want to focus on theatrical releases, but also because like maybe the movie was also bad? Question mark. <laughs> I don't know. But no, well, it doesn't matter. Like, it still would have made money. It doesn't yeah. matter if it was bad. <laughs> yeah, it's still, it still would have made money. Like it's, it's just so funny. They make a movie like, and usually you know that takes months, and you've had the script and everything. And then it's finished, and then you decide it's bad. It's like, why didn't you make that decision earlier? Yeah. Or make it good. Or make it good. good Save everyone that. The the easy the easy part is just to make it good, honestly. (laughs) Like Prey. Prey was really good, and I wish we got a theatrical release because it would have been really fucking cool. Yeah. And also one movie that I know Matt has seen, maybe you've seen it danger, but we didn't get to talk about it because lack of podcast recordings. Nope. Oh, yeah, I've, I've gone. Uh, nope was so fucking good. So amazing. Yeah, Although, yeah I, I loved it. I thought it was I honestly think it's Peel's best movie. I was the most or at least I was the most engaged in it. Like there's that he really knows how to build a scene, <laughs> like just build tension. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah. I do think the uh, UFO. The uh, I guess the was it UAP. Yeah. When it's just puking, it's the people's blood over the house. Oh god! Yeah, it's fucking awesome. That's like one of the best <laughs> scenes I've ever seen in the movie. Was like. <laughs> and the uh, and the whole Gordy's home sequence in the middle is oh, like that, terrifying. That yeah, was just. <laughs> Like, especially just the way they're slowly building it all up. And then you actually, like, see to a point what happened. And it's just that, like, uh, we're, I was talking about it with a friend. And that that is one of the two most, like, terrifying things in that is just this animal attack. But, like, it it's a, it's not like, a, you know, it's not like the giant, uh, new, you know, even Galleon angel thing that eats you. It's this thing that's sort of going to kill you, but it's going to take some time because it's just beating the crap out of you. It's not even trying to kill you. It's just trying to assert its dominance. Yeah. <laughs> like, like after, like after it's done beating the fuck out of that girl and you think she's dead until you see her disfigured face. Like, yeah. Like when she's at the UFO thing, um, but um, when he's beating the shit out of her, like on the ground, when he pops over, he just is playfully tapping her foot. Oh, I know. Like he's like, why aren't you getting back up? I don't know. Yeah. She ate her face and beat the fuck out of her. Like maybe that's why she's like getting back up. So in the newest issue of Fangoria, there uh, there's two. There's an article that Jordan Peele wrote in which he. It's really tongue in cheek. It's like this uh, flashy Hollywood hides animal attack uh, s- movie or show. And so it's all about that. But it's like him writing this like kind of glossy, funny, like, I mean, it's not funny because of what happens, but it's just this really like over the top kind of like Hollywood doesn't want you to see this. The Internet's been scrubbed and all these things. And this is why I made the movie was just to show this one scene. Um, so that's really <laughs> funny. And then. Like on the scary side, they were talking about the person that does did the motion capture for Gordy. And so like they had to upsize everything so he could kind of do it. And what was just scary and is totally perfect is when they were doing the um, audio recording, Jordan Peele told him just to breathe. And that's all they played was just, you know, his like heavy breathing. And it's just was like, oh, just adds to the creepiness. Just that and the fact that, like, the audience, you, like, you can still see them hiding is just yeah. 
terrifying. I also like how after he's after Gordy's done, he goes for the fist bump. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good punchline to that yeah. scene. <laughs> Oh God, that yes, that was great, and just yes, uh, the whole uh, the the uh, the alien angel thing was just like beautiful at the end. There, it was just he did such an awesome job with that. Oh, totally. Apparently, did you guys stay for the credits? No, yeah, I don't think so. so. Apparently, there was a post credit scene that I had no idea. What? And it's like really short, but it's like advertising a recreation of the incident at Jeep's ranch. Oh. <laughs> Weird. It's kind of showing like no one learned their lesson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we will sensationalize everything. <laughs> Which I think is a good kind of bow of the movie because the idea of like spectacles and yeah. how our relationship with them and also how like I kind of see the movie too as a love letter to the people who actually make movies work. Yeah. Because like you have the horse trainers, the cinematographer, like you have all these people that are like the behind the scenes people and they're the ones who are the heroes. Yeah. Even, uh, even Angel, the uh, the guy, the tech guy from the yeah. Fry's yeah. electronic store is basically like setting up all the cameras and all the electronics like he's a crew <laughs> member. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, if, yeah, if it's a, if it's a film set. So That's it's a good like, analog. I didn't I didn't quite put that together, but it's pretty implicit now that you mention it. Yeah. It was also <laughs> like uh OJ, he he's wearing his like what was it, Scorpion King hoodie that just says crew on the back of it and like yeah. the final parts of the movie too. Oh, that's great. That was crazy. And can we talk a second about what's his name's voice? <laughs> the, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. I know he's like what was he from? I think he's from The Crow and from something else. But the cinematographer oh, yeah. guy? Yes. <laughs> Just this the most intense voice ever. <laughs> and he's speaking in like cryptic riddles the entire time. <laughs> no one knows what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> They're like, sure, let's just let's just have him sing purple people eater. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I think I, I think what made me like that movie uh, the best out of all his movies is the kind of all the characters together are they're all very different from each other but they have this amazing kind of like push and pull in relationship where everybody is like creating this it's like a bunch of ingredients to make like the best tasting soup yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I, like a, a potato and a carrot aren't the same but they're in the same soup and that's what makes it delicious <laughs> i really wanted to see more of steve un's character oh i know he was awesome he was fucked <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, I like that we got just enough. It would have been cool to get more, but I think we needed just that taste of him just to, like, really hit home with what's happening. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, he was, he was he was cool. I really enjoy Steve Yuen. <laughs> um, yeah, he's good. Hey, he's a local boy for me. He's oh, from nice. Kalam he's from Kalamazoo. <laughs> Kalamazoo represent. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got you got two famous people from Kalamazoo than Matt, because like you have that besides the Tim Allen cocaine incident. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's all you need, really. That's, and we had an Elvis sighting at a Burger King. I mean, we are we are and three headed frogs. That's us. <laughs> but I have some like books I'll talk about in a bit. But my two big things are just pray and nope. Nice. But um, Matt, what about you? Yeah, so I took a dive into a Graham Masterton book called The House That Jack Built. Um, this came out like mid 90s and it is your, you know, Haunting of Hill House kind of giant mansion thing that is out in the middle of nowhere and is evil. Um, but so this is an interesting book. It opens up with our main character who's a lawyer in New York and he's like this big shot and he's going to a lunch or like a dinner and like it's raining and the taxi driver he doesn't like. So he gives the taxi driver a hard time. Taxi driver kicks him out. He ends up getting robbed, which is like a thing. But <laughs> to open this and all of this happens, the robbers pull down his pants take out his testicles and smash one of them with a hammer. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. This is like the first, I don't know, 20 pages of this book. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's where we're going with this. Um, and it just gets a little crazier from there. He He's dealing a lot of with this one testicle situation and 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 everything and so they find this house properly called valhalla um that was owned by a gambler back in the i don't know 20s or something like that and and he was this guy that like you start finding out he was like this really big womanizer and just this terrible person and of course because it's a scary book the house injects this character into our lawyer friend and he starts looking exactly like the lawyer and and making all these really stupid gambles and just like (laughs) i it was okay (laughs) i don't know why i picked this book up i feel like i had read about it somewhere and so i was like all right i'll give this a shot it's not like a paperbacks from hell but it could be a paperbacks from hell because it's just over the top with everything but like the uh, all the characters make horrible decisions. This, the wife, of the lawyer is just her whole, she is dealing with everything. They're going to buy this multi-million dollar mansion that's falling apart. And, and she has repeatedly said, I don't want to do this. And, and this house is haunted, but the lawyer is still on board for it. And so she's like, well, I don't want to be a spinster. So I'll just go for it. And it's just like, okay, that's the decision we're going with. That's how we're doing this. And it just, it just goes from there. I, it, it's okay. It wasn't the greatest. I, the funniest thing is I was looking through Goodreads and looking at some of the reviews and there was a person who I agreed with everything they said, but the funniest thing is that the, the reviewer did not finish the book and only had 10 pages left. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, I mean, I understand not finishing something, but like not you don't go that far and then not finish. Like you stop like in the in the middle at the at the latest. <laughs> like you're not it's, feeling it by the time you get to the middle. Like what are you doing? It's even like edging. <laughs> that, that, that kind of <laughs> I was just like, what? I'm like exactly. It's like I get it. But if you're that close, just power yeah. through. It reads really fast. So, like, it would have taken them 10 minutes to get through those 10 pages. <laughs> but, and it's, like, it's funny that you would tell everyone that. Like, I got all the way up to the end, and then I said, no, nah, I'm done. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like when I'm on a flight, and I'm watching a movie, and then the flight get, gets to where it's going, and there's, like... 15 minutes left in the fucking movie or, or five yeah. minutes. You're just like, God damn it. And they, you know, they shut the Wi-Fi off or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> like I'm so close. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. So I mean, know. I've tried one of his books. I tried the Manito. Yeah. Which is like, this woman has like this giant boil growing on the back of her neck <laughs> and is like, there's a fetus inside it. It makes sense. And then, like, he introduces a Native American medicine man. And I just kind of stopped reading after that. I was like, this is, this is like not good and pretty offensive. And I'm, I'm kind of done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, it, it was something I, I have a feeling like maybe if I read this like 15 years ago, I'd have loved it. But reading it now, I was just kind of like, what is happening? <laughs> All of this, everything that's happening. Like you could see all of a sudden our lawyers are like, oh, I'll bet you on this. I'll bet you on that. And they're like, gee, the previous owner was a big gambler. I don't understand what's happened. It was just a lot of dumb choices. And it's just like, OK, <laughs> so that was like the main thing. I guess the other one is I just finished uh, the um, Puppet Puppet King by Justin Burnett. And that's just absolutely amazing. Ooh, it's a short the, story. The first story of that collection is so fucking good. Yes, it's yeah, I think it's like, I don't know, 13, 14 short stories. It's very I mean, it even says on the back, if you like Thomas Ligotti, if you like John Padgett, you're going to be a big fan of this. And I think it's even it's different than all those. So I don't want you to be like, oh, this guy is just, you know, doing the same thing. Um, But he he just it's very dark. It's very uh has certain philosophies again if you like Legati, you'd understand where that's coming from it's just so good probably one of the best um that i've read this year it's just i 
absolutely adored it. So, awesome. Are, that's my stuff. Uh, Danger, what about you? Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, last night we watched Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that film. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the second time I've seen it, but it is one of those like endlessly fascinating performances uh, yeah. from both Betty Davis and um, what's her name? Joan Crawford. Crawford. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just so fucking good. Like it's my favorite kind of like horror where like it's kind of bordering on camp, but it's also very serious at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and everything's just like kind of dialed up to eleven. Um, do I need to recap this movie? Uh, it's what you guys. No, I think <laughs> I, I think we all know kind of what this movie. Oh, you're good. <laughs> it's you it's watch... pretty fucked up, but it's really great. What was the one the show they did on FX that was sort of about that? Um... Oh, feud. I I didn't get to see yeah. that, but they were everyone. We were hanging out. There was a group of us watching it last night, and everyone was talking about it. And I'm like sitting there in the corner, like I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I haven't watched it either, but I just yeah. knew that that's what. And so I was like, oh, it would be interesting to see both of those. Someone said they it, cast Susan Sarandon as Betty Davis, and I'm like, that's fucking good casting. They got like that <laughs> those big eyes, the you know, big expressive eyes, both of them. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I can't look at Susan Sarandon without thinking like the ASPCA. Was she the ASPCA person? <laughs> yeah, I think she yeah. was for a bit. <laughs> yeah. What is ASPCA? I don't even. It's the. That, it's like the, an animal thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sad music, and they're like, if you don't adopt these dogs, they'll fucking die. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like that where they play Sarah McLaughlin, and all the people, all the dogs are like shaking and everything like that. So. <laughs> no. And it's like, I'm just trying to watch Family Feud. Because, like, why, why do I have to think about emaciated dogs? This is not, this is not what I signed up for. I want to I wanna watch Steve Harvey make fun of these idiots. That's right. what, all that's all why I, I turned on the television. <laughs> These families act all super wacky. <laughs> <laughs> See them all poorly dance. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's a stage direction? Don't dance too good, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll dance it back just a little bit yeah. oh my god what was i watching recently but it was like the same idea as like these crazy people and they would do the like worst dancing and you're like what are you like did they tell you to do this or are you just choosing <laughs> <laughs> oh it was the new supermarket sweep oh my god that's yeah it's this new supermarket sweep yes leslie jones is the host and it is absolutely insane <laughs> I just watched a new Beavis and Butthead yesterday. Again? Oh, dude. Oh, no, <laughs> that's there's, the there's, movie, there's, right? It's the new episodes now. Oh, there's a oh. show now, too? There's a show now. Oh, God. Damn. And it's in modern day. Oh, my God. And instead of reacting to music, like, remember when they tried to redo it and they did the whole they reacting to, like, the fucking Jersey Shore and shit? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> well, now it's actually them reacting to, like, TikToks and YouTube, and it's fucking hilarious. Oh, no. <laughs> Like there was one where they reacted to a BTS music video. Wow. And Beavis likes BTS. <laughs> uh, of course. But like the show is pretty funny. It's like the first episode is these two girls are trying to go to an escape room, but they need four people. So they're looking for two more. And Beavis and Butthead are just like outside being idiots. <laughs> so they get them to join them on the escape room. But they misread, they mishear the person and they walk into the bathroom and okay. they can't get out because they're pulling on the push door. Oh, so God. It's the escape room. <laughs> oh, my <So> God. <laughs> <laughs> that is ridiculous. I had no idea they were doing more episodes. That's great. Yeah, it's on Paramount Plus. We uh, watched the movie and it was the do, Beavis and Head do the universe. It was so yeah. fucking funny. Like, I, I, you know, I thought it was going to be stupid and it was but like in the best way <laughs> no, maybe this is going to do the universe is fucking hilarious yeah <laughs> i will say before we get into the discussion i have some manga that i read the last week <laughs> and 
So remember, like, last year, Matt, when I was talking about the Drifting Classroom by Cosmo Umez? Yes. So we're getting, we're finally getting more Cosmo Umez manga in English. Oh, nice. Like, for those who don't know, because I'm a fucking weeb, um, <laughs> for those who don't know, Cosmo Umez was a manga author back in, like, the 1960s and 1970s, and he was a really big inspiration to Junji Ito. Nice. So, like... You can trace a lot of Ito's stuff back to Umez. And now we're getting, we're finally getting an official English translation of his Orochi stories, which they're all kind of short stories about this girl named Orochi who is paranormal and, and she has like blood magic. And there's this funny bait, all her stories where she just points at people and like magic shit happens. And (laughs) it's always really fucking funny every time. Um, but each of the stories is like she gains an interest on like a character or a family. And then the story is just those characters with Orochi kind of watching them in the background. And they get really fucked up. Like there's like one that ends with like a child gets locked away in the basement when like the two parents end up dying. And Orochi is trying to like find the child to at least make something good happen. And when she finds a child who's like a fucking like four year old boy, his skin's just running off his bones because he's been abandoned in a room for fucking days. <laughs> what? I... <laughs> what was in the basement? <laughs> Nothing, just the kid. The, the 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 guy locked the kid away because he was trying to get revenge on his wife. So his, the uh, full his context skin... of the story is the this man gets married or the woman gets married. Her husband gets hit by a car, then gets recovered. Then he falls off a cliff and dies (laughs) because of course he does. That's the way it goes. And Orochi (laughs) feels very bad that this has happened and wants to try to like fix it. So she uses her magic and she thinks her magic failed because the body she's trying to build for this man doesn't revive. But instead, the man revives in his grave and he digs himself out of his own grave nice. and he's alive in a rotting body. Huh. So throughout the story, his body keeps on rotting more and more and more as the story goes on. And the woman has remarried and has a kid now. And the twist is the woman pushed him off the cliff and killed him. So he hides. He kidnaps her child and hides him to like a revenge against her. And then both him and her end up killing each other. So the child gets locked in this room and no one knows where where he is. So although she's trying to find find him, so something good happens. And then somehow his skin falls off. Well, he's 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 dead so long that like it's already started decomposing. Okay, (laughs) she's trying to figure out the weird basement and like skin doesn't just like melt off normally. So. It's just, it's it, yeah, it's 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 supposed to be morbid and weird, but like each of the each of the things is just like an independent short story that all kind of follow these different weird characters. Nice. And they get funny. They get dark. They get morbid. Um, and they're fucking wild. And I can <laughs> see how much he was an influence on Ito. Yeah. And I'm happy that we're getting more of his stuff in English. Oh, that's cool. Because, yeah, we didn't really get this stuff before. (laughs) But that's kind of it for me. I'm ready to go to the moon if you guys are. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm already there. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Let's go outside. I I got a slug right next to me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. The slugs. (laughs) (laughs) I... I'm like trying to think of even where to begin. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I, I, I will say before I get thing, my favorite part of the book, I had to highlight this, is when they're they're uh, coming up names of the slugs, and it's like Swimple Swimmin', okay. Princess Booker <laughs> Beans, Robert Snellford, Robert Snellford Jr., Robert Snellford the <laughs> Third. <laughs> Yeah, it they, is a long line of Robert Snailfords on the on the moon. There's a it's kind of a dynasty out there. <laughs> it's, it's not in the book. It's it's just you know kind of that backstory. I was, <laughs> I was 
Or like, what was this other paragraph I highlighted that was like, hey, gang, no worries. I just bumped into Chrome. He's doing a fantastic job out here. In fact, you all are. I know things are kind of tense when we first landed, but that's yesterday's news. I want us to work together. Now, come on. I want to introduce you to all my other new friends. This is Robert Snellford and Robert Snellford Jr. and Robert Snellford III and Robert Snellford IV. And it just kind of ends in ellipses. Yeah. He, he also names one of the slugs Bilbo Sluggins. Yes. Uh, which doesn't even make sense because Lord of the Rings they didn't come out. <laughs> for, it's not going to come out for fifty more years after this book takes place. But <laughs> yeah, that that is that is for uh, this book is not written for people from nineteen hundred who will go. I don't understand this joke. So people in twenty twenty two will understand what I'm talking about, and that's who I wrote it for. <laughs> not... Or how the people are like using modern day slang. <laughs> yeah, but don't know what a satellite is. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I was like, well, you kind of have people making the internet and cell phones. So like Bilbo, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of steampunky, except I've never read it or seen or paid any attention to what steampunk is or actually does. <laughs> I know they I use like clocks steampunk. to build things or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. This is moon punk. It's yeah. moon punk. I love it. <laughs> so I guess the best way to describe moon fellows is it follows our narrator, who's uh, Mr. Crumb, right? Mr. Crumb. Yeah, Franklin Crumb. Franklin Crumb. And he is involuntarily selected for a government program to send him to the moon because of his grave digging abilities. <laughs> yes, I just yeah. love that. It's all like scientists and Air Force pilots, and then it's He's a grave digger. <laughs> well, he's and the reason why they chose him is because he's very great at digging, and they need him to dig into the moon to find MacGuffinite. Yeah, because yeah we have, we, they 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 invent the technology to get people to the moon, yet no, nothing to excavate. There's not like a bulldozer or a plow. They need a man with a shovel, <laughs> just one as well. What? Get that MacGuffinite. Yeah, get the MacGuffinite. <laughs> and I love that his practice, and I won't jump it all over, but like at one, they, they all go and they all get taken into this giant like hangar type of thing, and are and, and, and Crumb has to just dig into cement. <laughs> 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 like just practice, just practice digging. Yeah, well, they they say to him, they're like, we don't know if the moon is going to be like soft sand or hard rock. So you got to just train with the hardest stuff we could think of. <laughs> Turns out the moon's very dusty. It's mostly yeah, just dust. Yeah. Dust everywhere. I also love how ridiculous everything in the story is. It's just like, it's a lot of fun. And that's the best way I can describe it. But it also gets really heartfelt at a few points, too. Yeah. Like... I think you did a really great job balancing the emotions between like the zany bizarreness of it and then like the heartfeltness of like the characters being stranded on the moon. Yeah, I mean, you know, I write like I'm not really like thinking about what kind of genre I'm doing as I'm going. I'm just kind of writing the story, but uh, so, so the cut, it does kind of jump all over into like sci-fi territory and there's alternate history and there's horror stuff, body horror stuff specifically all throughout it. It's pretty and, good. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of goo in bugs and I guess slugs is not not bugs, but slugs and <laughs> all this shit. But like at the, at the same time, the main focus and the thing I think of is just the kind of emotional core of the story and what the characters are feeling. So. I know people tend to say my stuff is funny, but I'm like, no, my stuff is, these are tragedies. I'm not writing comedies. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> Sad it, things. Exactly. But it's because I'm only thinking about that part of the story um, when I think of the story. You know, that's kind of how I always frame it. <laughs> well, I also love how, like, what was it? They they have no idea, like, like the story gets very heartfelt once they're stranded on the moon, but once they're getting to the moon, it's just like fucking ridiculous <laughs> and really funny. Well, and it's funny too for a, for a, a couple of those things. Just a, we'll go back a little bit because I had read Puppet Skin and he digs a hole, 
And you're right, like, of course, those two and even this one, they both are all three, I should say, are are zany. But like, yeah, especially he digs a hole is that like concept of this like couple together and like what that um, what that's like after being together for a long time and just trying to figure out something new. And and it is it's like, of course, it's it, it there, there's the wackiness of he cut off his hands and put shovels on him and it was digging and and then what they find underneath. And, you know, I'm trying to remember the worms in that one and, and like kind of falling in love with the worm, but not. But like all, all and even puppet skin, just about like finding something new and all these people. And, and so like it it is that and i think that's what's really cool and and hope like people hopefully like kind of catch all of that is this like that there is of course there's this funny exterior but a nice chewy uh sadness interior <laughs> oh, totally yeah I, re- I realized recently why i have a hard time writing horror i mean these are all horror books in in to some degree or another they are i mean that's where you would probably find them if you were looking for them but I don't really understand like how to build tension the way a horror person does, like where you're like, oh, a person is slowly creeping and then there's a relief of that tension. And that's that's, you know, horror is about that building. And then, you know, the guy pops out and stabs you and that's the end of the scene or, you know, or they (laughs) run and now it's the action part of the scene. I don't really know how to create that when I'm writing. I'm just more like I'm giving you some sort of dark direction like things are going to degrade and they're just not going to get better and the and the tension for me is just like how are people going to cope with the fact that they are helpless <laughs> yeah, yeah whatever these things are that that are that they're up against these giant concepts and stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So and I find that horrifying. I find being trapped somewhere without any hope of rescue and then that's it. Yeah. Horrifying. <laughs> like yeah. there is there is a antagonist in the book that is there's a there's a squaring off of people and you know there's a monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but oh, that's not really the scary part to me. The scary part is you're stuck on a on the moon. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's it. That's scary enough. Like, think about what that actually means. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're also, they're also stuck on the moon with no way to get food. Like, yeah. they can't, yeah. they can't really do anything. They're, they're completely just stranded. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the, like, uh, cause I agree. I like that kind of idea. And I like that for, again, the three that I, of yours that I've read, where it is, it kind of just, you're left it with just knowing that they're in this situation and that it's not going to get better. And, you know, talking about earlier Lagatti and, and, and Burnett, it's like, it's funny that you don't actually come up in those, but like, you do have that same idea of this like dark ending while there it's very funny throughout all of it. But by the time you get to the end, you're like, well, crap, especially, you know, I won't spoil it, but the, what, kind of happens in Moonfellows near the end of stuff happening and, and not even with the slugs, but the other thing um, that you described, your sciencey description for the moon time, um, that's like horrifying if you think about it, just like knowing and like, especially with what Crumb is doing at the end, you're just like, God, that's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um but like to get back to some of the funny stuff and then we can get into the darker stuff. I, 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 <laughs> I was dying with the way you make the president and the way you make the situation, which I guess is horrifying too, is like these, everybody except for our moon fellows are complete jerks and they just like kidnap these people. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, they just like take them and they're like treating them like crap and they, they're forcing them to smile <laughs> and chain smoking cigars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every president smoking cigars. <laughs> so like, I guess like a question for this is like, do you, how do you get like, do you kind of aim for the humor and then go in or does the humor just sort of come out? Um, I don't. Yeah. See, it just kind of comes out. I, I, I do want to work in 
I mean, these are absurdist books, right? That would be yeah. what they would you would put this uh, under if, if there's no absurdist genre. <laughs> but <laughs> they are. But they are. That's kind of what it is, right? When you don't start in reality and you don't end up in reality. This is a completely different version of the world. And so things are unpredictable in ways that the reader uh, uh, aren't isn't going to be able to kind of suss out. Like so, when I think about how absurdity works when you're, you know, you're faced with a situation that some sort of incong incongruity, you could kind of go either direction. You could lean and it doesn't take a lot. You can lean just a bit to one direction and it's funny, right? Even mm -hmm. you think about slapstick comedy, it is violent, like people beating the shit out of each other or getting mortally <laughs> wounded, but it's played for laughs. Um, or you lean the other direction uh, where it's not funny at all. In fact, it's horrifying. And now it's a horror book. And <laughs> yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize how close these two things are. Um, and I like to try to, you know, to varying degrees of success, walk along that e edge and, and kind of keep the book unpredictable of what it is going to do to you emotionally. Yeah. Um, and I, the people who like my writing, respond to that and there's a whole contingent of people who go i just want a simple story that's just going to tell me the story and how <laughs> i expect it to happen and michael you're reading the wrong guy then sorry <laughs> <laughs> so I, have, I have a question actually yeah what what gave you the idea for this book oh um there's two things um, the first is the jo George or Millier's film, uh, yeah. A Trip to the Moon, which he made in 1902, I think. It's one of the first movies ever made. It's a silent movie, obviously. Uh, everyone knows the image of the moon with the rocket in his eye with the face on it, though. It's a very famous yes. image. Right. Um, I mean, but that's what that's from. Pumpkins, right? Yeah, yeah. They they did the, that whole video uh, tonight. tonight. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted something that kind of evoked that kind of we don't know anything about science, but we are going to imagine what these things are. Like, you know, we're 70 years from the real moon landing <laughs> at that point. <laughs> so they didn't know. They thought maybe there was aliens up there. Maybe uh, there's a whole society. We don't know. Um, yeah. So that's kind of was my jumping off point. The other thing, though, was uh, I found out that JFK uh, – when the real moon landing happened, he made his speech. Uh, you know, we choose to go to the moon and not because it's easy, because it's hard. You know, that <laughs> famous speech about <laughs> them going to the moon. There is a second speech that he didn't make uh, in case the mission failed. Mm. The one that says these men are dead and <laughs> they tried. <laughs> and that's, you know, we'll remember them because of that. So they sacrifice I, I, more than you will ever sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, so I read, you know, it's a short speech, you know, it's solemn, but he didn't have to make it. So I was kind of imagining this world where the moon landing was a complete disaster. <laughs> JFK <laughs> had to make this speech. And I'm like, what would be different? And would we have kept trying to go up there? Or would we have just said, that's it. It's a failure. So let's not ever do this again. This is insane. Why would we even try this to begin with? So I just kind of mashed those two things together, and that's that was kind of my jumping off point. <laughs> well, I love that. Like when you kind of like think for sci-fi books and stuff like that, it's always kind of the, uh, you know, or even like, well, like William Gibson or like Neil, um, Neil Stevenson or whatever. Like they're always kind of thinking what's going to happen in twenty years, and so they write their book for that. What I like for yours is like you're sort of doing that, but you're putting your time to like 1906. So it's like <laughs> this really like I was trying to think of any other modern books I've read where they've like push it in the past besides like alternate history kind of thingies. But like imagining what they would have imagined the future would have been like. And it was just because it's like perfect the way you get the technology and the ideas and everything. I mean, just like the computer being as big as a room and can only do math and, and how they're like, <laughs> Matt, the, it, it, it can only do addition and subtraction. Get it yeah. right. <laughs> and it makes a cup of coffee too. There's a big yeah. gigantic <laughs> coffee machine. Did it like take a month for the coffee? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> 
but I like I I love that because it's like, like such a you know like if we're gonna go into like the horror aspect, I always kind of like those when you look back at what people thought they could do like you know session nine not that yours is related to that in any way but like just that idea of like what they were doing in that asylum like 60 years ago thinking that that was modern and like now we're like oh my god it was barbaric still sort of the same idea here where you're like yeah they just sort of like went up in this like rickety balloon <laughs> I, I actually have a question but it's kind of a spoiler uh oh do you, do you mind me asking deals at the end of the book no, that's fine. How did Leif Erikson get to the moon? <laughs> How did he? He, he kind yeah. of explains it in his letter or in yes. his journal. Yeah, it, it, it was a slick uh, lots was, of goats. It, yeah, it was, it was two, twenty thousand slaughtered goats. <laughs> the fat of twenty thousand slaughtered goats lined a riverbed. And then a twine was strung up between two mountains and his sailboat was put into the dry riverbed, lubed up riverbed. Could have used Astroglide. Uh, <laughs> and they kind of just slung shot him into the into the moon. <laughs> uh, I was thinking that, about how Vikings came to America before the Christopher Columbus and all this shit. And they're always like, oh, Columbus discovered America. And it's like, yeah. not to even mention that the fact that there was already people here. But, I, you know, like it, as far as like American history books goes. Yeah. Um, they don't mention the Leif Erikson either. So I'm like, well, what else, what else would, who else was out there trying to discover things that long ago that were undiscovered at that point? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I just sort of remembered, cause I was thinking when you br brought up the absurdist stuff, you know, I think it's interesting because, you know, like your stuff and like Brian Asman, um, and even like Carlton Malik the third, like yeah. their stuff, it, it, all of your stuff. It's interesting that like, cause it is that humor. I think it helps with the narrator usually kind of throwing in that humor and then obviously just what's happening in there. But, you know, I was thinking of you talking about the other way of that. And like, you could even kind of say like Nicole Cushing or like Betty Rocksteady, they do a really good job of that same absurdist, like, kind of craziness of whatever's happening but they like their humor maybe is not ticked up <laughs> just that much but like it's i i like that kind of thing you know i just kind of thinking about like taking a story and and i mean like you said you do put the horrors there but i think it's just the absurdist part of it is a little bit more um so I don't know if like if you read have you read any other like absurdist stuff that you really like that maybe kind of like inspired you in anything? I mean, I'm familiar with all those people you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but like Carlton, I mean, there's the bizarro writing scene out here in Portland where uh Carlton is kind of one of the uh Carlton Mellick, who you just mentioned, is one of the first guys to start doing this thing uh about 20 years ago, uh, where they we're doing horror is a through the absurdist lens with with comedy and with uh, with everything kind of amped up. And when I discovered him, which was probably about 12 years ago myself, uh, it to me felt like it was the thing I was always kind of doing. And I didn't realize you could actually go all the way with it. And that he was kind of a, a one of the guys who opened the door for me, uh, at least unlocking that that piece of in my head that says, I'm on the right track. So like, don't, don't try to compromise the way you want to tell stories because you think this is going to sell better a different way. Mm -hmm. Like just say it the way you can say it, because that's the only way I'm going to really be able to do it. In the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, believe me, if I could sell out, if I had the ability to write something that was a uh, big, massive popular fiction piece that something everybody wants i would be doing that in a heartbeat <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think i could fucking do it i can only do my weird thing <laughs> hey you but, never know I, I saw man fuck this house at barnes and noble so yeah oh they people can swing around like that's what i'm that's what i'm that's what i'm working for you know i i but i i'm only bringing the danger slater thing you know, i'm not <laughs> not uh not trying to do somebody else's game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One well, and I think it's interesting, like, because, you know, talking about writing stuff like that, because I, I've 
was thinking about that for this one thing, like a couple of things that I've been working on. And it's, it, that helps a lot because it is hard when, you know, you are kind of thinking of like, well, do I ramp up this crazy rabbit story and make it kind of funny? Or do I try to focus, you know, try to ground it a little bit. And it's, it's good to hear and good to read stuff where people are like, no, we're going to be completely bonkers and it's still, it's going to work amazing. So it's cool to hear. There's um, um, you said you read puppet skin. So one of my favorite things that I did in, with that book, I think it's like on page one or two where I'm, I'm kind of explaining the rules to the puppet world. Uh, for yeah. This girl, which is uh, when you are, you, you start as a human person and when you graduate middle school they uh put these strings into you that pump you full of this goop that turns yeah. you into wood and then there's strings attached to your hands and they go up to giant void holes in the sky where <laughs> some unseen puppeteer is controlling everyone on earth um so you know that's a lot to swallow and i just kind of lay it out and go that's how it works i'm like yeah. i'm not going to really explain how any of it really works because it doesn't hold up the scrutiny because we're these stories are all allegorical and that's kind of really what they're trying to say so we don't really need to fucking be concerned with the logistics of how does someone with strings move around inside of a house or get from one room to another right like because it, it doesn't fucking matter it's the least important part of the story <laughs> it's the logistics of how that works and if someone's getting hung up on it this obviously isn't the story for them no <laughs> like even Moonfellows, I, I I tried to frame this as a fairy tale. There's it's yeah. starts with the, like kind of almost like a classic fairy tale. There once was a man who lived on the moon. Yeah. Like, and he talks about the power of mythology and building your own mythologies and stories his mom used to tell them. And that's the very first thing that happens in Moonfellows. And it kind of swings back around to that in the end, because I wanted to kind of usher people into this way of thinking to go. We don't have to ask why a balloon can make it to the moon? Why yeah. is there oxygen on the moon? Why does this time thing work the way it does? Why does why are there <laughs> slugs there? Like there's 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 explanations given here or there, but they are all self-contained within the world itself and not really beholden to the way physics or science or the real world necessarily works. <laughs> a, a side note for the moon timing thing. I don't know if you saw the movie Lightyear, but they do that exact same concept in that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I was kind of making fun of uh, Interstellar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a couple nods throughout the book that are making fun of like sci-fi movies and tropes and stuff. Uh, oh, fuck, it just totally left my mind. Oh, MacGuffinite is kind of making fun of Avatar, where they're they're looking for unobtainium. Is yeah, the name of the stupid mineral that they're on that, that Avatar planet for. Oh my God! It's like they put all this money and and creativity into that, and the title they came up with for was unattainable. I know. I, I I actually got super excited when stuff like that happens in a movie. I, like <laughs> my face lights up. I raise my arms in triumph because it's so <laughs> fucking like stupid. And I'm like, how did this get here? Like, yeah. I, I I am delighted by it because I'm like, there is a hundred in, in Avatar, probably thousands of people who could have said like, really, guy, yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. James. <laughs> like you you sure you don't up. want to just like come up with anything else like what uh, well, i don't forgot what the name of the planet was but like we could just call it avatar realm or whatever yeah. you know? <laughs> no unobtainium because it's hard to get it's you see it's heady like that <laughs> oh, it's so one true. thing i do love though is like when they get the they get the satellite phone thing working and they got yeah. to the president and the pres is like, wait, you guys fucking made it like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they, they all completely stopped thinking about it the second they floated away. <laughs> He's like, yeah, we, we ended that program. Like, what about the president? Yeah, he died. I'm president now. And uh, yes, yeah, everything's cool. It's cool now. We don't really care about the MacGuffinite. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, it's just perfect. Uh, and Rich, I had to I have to ask you. Between our moon sex scene in this and our leaf sex scene in the nest, which did you like better? <laughs> Ooh. It's hard to say. <laughs> the, moon, the moon sex scene was pretty good. Not yeah. Me. The moon was a bad boy, and <laughs> yeah, it, need, it needed some loving. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, I do just... think this had better body horror than... Oh. Um, 
a hundred percent. The next. Yes. Like that. When- the the moon is making the guy all goopy and he keeps on fucking it and like yeah. <laughs> the slugs are taking over his body. So like <laughs> this is like your unofficial tr- bug trilogy, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, they're it's they're in all of the books. Are I, they? I, yeah. <laughs> there's always some kind of insect or kind of creature that is just kind of watching or or sometimes playing <laughs> a lot more uh, in it. Uh, except for Impossible James, I wrote that look. It didn't have bugs, but a man that makes clones of himself and he's impregnating himself with his clones, and they keep getting. He keeps trying to perfect his formula for cloning, so he 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 wants to make more and more copies of himself, and he's like, it's taking too long, and I can only hold one baby at a time. So he starts making them smaller. So essentially, he's replacing all the cells in his body with his own little clones of himself. To- <laughs> <laughs> to, to do his thing. So uh, instead of like creepy crawly bugs, it's like creepy crawly versions of himself, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> but yeah, I, I like, I don't know. I like, insects are super weird because they're like, it's like living on the planet with aliens. Like, they, what the fuck are they? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you look at an insect's face, you're like, how? How did we all come from the same slime? What is this? <laughs> It is. It's super weird. The colors and just the legs. And you're like, what? What are you like? What is your goal here? Yeah. <laughs> They're always doing something weird. Those bugs. Plus, I, one of my one of my favorite movies, one of my most influential movies of my whole life was The Fly, the David Cronenberg movie. So, uh, nice. you know, it's a goopy body horror movie with bugs in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of works its way into everything. I love The Fly. Yeah. I also I also love like in this book how everyone in the book gets training to like go to the moon and even after all of it they're still like super unqualified for everything they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and these are our best and brightest. They don't but they yeah, they didn't have enough time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they had like a month of training and then the president's like, yeah. "Now we got to go now." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God. It was just perfect. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think about like feeling the book is a, a lot about loneliness and feeling alone or alienated from people around you or the yeah. kind of world around you. So a part of that emotionally for me or for someone experiencing it is having this lack of control. Like you feel alienated from the world because you can't control what anything what anyone is doing around you. And maybe you don't even understand it or you feel like it doesn't understand you. So having these kind of forces moving these characters around against their will and them just kind of going along with it is kind of just a a further extension or extrapolation of that. Uh, Not to mention that it kind of satirizes, you know, American culture in a lot of (laughs) ways too. And, uh, you know, this kind of do first, ask questions later, (laughs) you know, we'll worry about this. We'll worry about the consequences when the consequences come. Um, yeah. We'll cross this bridge when we get to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, the government wipes its hands clean and goes, I, we had nothing to do with that. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I there's, again, like, to talk about, like, the time dilation thing and what you kind of do with that, again, just showed it sort of shows that, like, things that are happening out of everyone's control and that kind of can-do attitude, I thought that was, like, a a nice like touch of like, yeah, all these things happen and, and, you know, nobody did anything. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. We'll say though, watch having the main character, watch his like wife and child grow up without him was like really heartbreaking. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I think about my own life and all these places I've been and people who I've had a part of my life and, I've kind of always been on the move. I've been, you know, I've lived in a lot of places and had a lot of groups of friends and stuff. And you all kind of stay. There's this thing where because of social media, Facebook and Twitter and whatever, you're kind of like stuck with these people that in every other time in human history, you would just keep moving on with your life. But now I'm like watching coworkers I had 15 years ago, raised their children, someone I haven't talked to for a fucking decade and didn't really even get along with when I did know them. They were just some coworker. I'm like, 
what the fuck am I doing? Like, why am I watching all this unfold? And yeah. it's like, you know, it, I have this, such a weird relationship with social media because at one point it's very fun to kind of just make jokes and have everyone <laughs> kind of play along and stuff. But at the same time, it's like, here's a joke. Hey, my grandpa died. Yeah. Uh, hey, my cat died. I Oh, I just got a good promotion. It's just this like push and pull of like good, bad, silly, serious, and there's no filter or way to organize it. And it's just all coming at you yes. without you being able to do or anything about it, um, except for turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> the only fucking solution, uh, which, uh, you know, again, a spoiler of the book is that's how yeah. they solve that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they stop looking. <laughs> Uh, it's so true though it like it, it it's exactly that and i always like I, that same thought process like you'll see somebody like especially like a twitter is one thing and then like facebook's another it's like they're posting these giant like heartfelt like deep emotion stuff and one i'm like well i'm probably sitting on the toilet reading this so that kind of dampens <laughs> this like heartfelt moment and two, it is. It's exactly that. Because like then the next post is like, look at the stupid meme or whatever. And you're just kind of like, nothing matters. Yeah. It's like all of this is just how can you weigh and judge it? And again, kind of like what you were showing in this, where it's just all these events that happen in American history. But it's just the way it's played out. It's like, well, how can you even appreciate or feel that situation? I mean, in the past you could because you were in it but now with social media it's just so like you go from one extreme to the other it is it's a it's an interesting kind of world we're living in and it's exactly what you kind of play up in here where you're just kind of like well they're dealing with their own tragedy but then they're also watching all this just sort of flash and then you still kind of have this like family dynamic thing happening that the, he's watching and you're just kind of like well what the hell, what's happening and then at the same time you have the maid cleaning up cigar butts and presidents putting their feet up and everything so it is it's just kind of a spectrum if you want to if you want to hear some see some like fucking weird shit on social media go to your facebook memories and just oh, scroll God. back to the very beginning okay oh, and just look at the shit you're posting like 11 12 years ago <laughs> Dude, I got a you know how they'll do like on this day and they give you some old post that you did on Facebook. To, to <laughs> yeah, remind you. I had one that from 14 years ago and I was like, what the fuck? 14 yeah. years? I've been on this <laughs> stupid website for 14 years. This is insane. Oh, seriously. Oh, man. Uh, so <laughs> I re like not to like detract, but yeah, being on Facebook, I think I joined Facebook. I was still in college and I had to do an article about this like weird group in town that would like they were adults but they would like play tag and like Mar like red <laughs> rover and stuff okay. and so like that's why i joined facebook and now i'm like what the heck like on my facebook 13 years ago some guy i don't even talk to anymore what's up dude we should def chill sometime soon <laughs> <laughs> oh man you should you should reply to that now. Hey, <laughs> you, what you doing? What you doing? Yo, Tuesday? dog, what's up? <laughs> it's like I just died. <laughs> My grandpa's dead. Oh shit, that sucks. that sucks. Oh man, that's another one too. You fucking how many ghosts do you have on your Facebook profile? Oh, or, or, or or I mean, there's probably some you don't even know on Twitter. Uh, you know, because right. who the hell knows what these people are? But uh, <laughs> but like, I have friends that have been dead for a fucking long time but we're still facebook friends so good. like it's weird <laughs> it is it's a strange yeah. like thing to have that's part of why i made him a grave digger in the book because yeah i was talking about this thing too but it's this like guy who's kind of face to face with like death <laughs> all the time yeah, yeah. He, like has to has to kind of you know, but he's he's it's his job, too. So he's not really like super connected to it. It's just like this specter that he is is part of his life. He is a really good grave digger, though. <laughs> the best. Yeah, the yeah. best. The, the best. best. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So uh, what's next? Well, what do you mean? Like what books what do I have coming out next? Yeah. What are you working on next? Man, I have I. 
I have four fucking books already written that are in various <laughs> stages of possibly coming out or uh, I've signed a contract for one. I suppose I could mention that now, even though it hasn't been announced. Uh, <laughs> I, I did put my name on a contract, so that would make it official. Um, <laughs> so I did. I wrote another book for Max, so a ghoulish book nice. uh, for 2024. It'll be coming out. It's called Starlet. I don't, I don't know why I'm promoting a book that's going to come out in two years. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is perfect. It's like a good super teaser. Yeah, it's a Hollywood satire, so it's another dark comedy. A um, little more horror-oriented horror than Moonfellows, but... You know what, Danger? It might be coming out in two years from now, but it'll come out tomorrow on the moon. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It'll come out in... How, wait, what's the fucking... <laughs> I think it's like two weeks to a. I don't yeah. fucking remember. Oh, it's it's thirty days to a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. In about a week on the in moon. A, yeah, <laughs> it'll already be out. <laughs> so you're doing it through Ghoulish and not Perpetual, because I know he's got kind of like the two things happening. Yeah, I can't really speak for exactly what his plan is there but from what i understand he started the ghoulish brand to be a little more horror focused and uh -huh. he's mostly going to be focusing on that is kind of what i heard from him he's like we'll still have perpetual motion books but most of his effort is going to be behind ghoulish because he's like horror is <laughs> <laughs> what's selling <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely uh it, it's awesome what he's doing he's he's killing it over there so that's super sweet yeah he's such a good editor he's super funny uh we get uh I, I went to the ghoulish book fest in san antonio in early um april and stayed at his house and we got along <laughs> great and we had a lot of fun so that's amazing yeah <laughs> you see the bathroom where he wrote uh we need to do something in <laughs> i didn't see the bathroom because that's his bathroom so he had two bathrooms in his house and there's the one for him and Lori. And then the one for Lori's son, and I was staying in Lori's son's room. He wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> he left. <laughs> just sleeping I was on the staying floor. in his room. Yeah, I'm just imagining Max listening to this podcast now with just us talking about his bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be like, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the door opens out, though. Oh. Apparently this is, a, this is a real thing. I know it's such a funny thing that people are giving a hard time about. I've seen both, so it does exist. <laughs> I've seen both too. Or like uh, suspend your disbelief over literally this easiest fucking thing to suspend your disbelief <laughs> over. A I door know. opening one direction or another. Like who <laughs> the fuck cares? It has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people are just stupid. Yeah. Oh, man. Awesome. Well, this was, yeah, I think for everybody, get Moonfellows. Hopefully we didn't spoil it too much. It's definitely a fun, amazing book. Yeah, thank oh, you. Thank definitely. You. Like, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, it is really just a hodgepodge of all the emotions. <laughs> and it's a good time. Just I appreciate both of you reading it, too, and uh, having me on the show. Oh, no problem. Well, I think, you, you know, staring into the abyss, that is a theme of the book. So that is, Ooh. this is very much. We're getting lost into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, yeah, we're getting you there onto the moon. And then you just stare and you just, just enjoy the sounds <laughs> of voices. <laughs> to enjoy slug slime. It is this, you know, we are we are recording this and it is getting beamed in the space and it will travel unimpeded until it hits something, which could <laughs> potentially be alien ears. Right. Aliens might listen to this. It is not inconceivable. I mean, we have to what? They thank Dr. Tanaka for all of that, because yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it wasn't for his technology, vending the Internet, and, <laughs> was... uh, GPS and oh. cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty a, much anything you need to yeah. fill a plot hole in. <laughs> He's able Thanks, to Dr. Invent. Tanaka. Oh my and god. I, everybody listening at home, be sure to give the Abyss some solid ratings and definitely pick up Danger's book because it's honestly a really fantastic read. 
Thank you. And Thanks. uh Danger, where can our listeners get in touch with you? Um social media, actually. <laughs> that I can't look away from. Uh right. <laughs> so Twitter's the best place, my most active one. Uh danger underscore slater. Or Instagram works too. Or you could just hit Google Danger Slater and uh <laughs> you'll find me. All right, Matt, what about you? I am on Twitter at Brandenburg DM. You can follow me on Twitter with at Rudy5388 and be sure to follow Abyss with at Into Staring. And this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. <laughs>